Donald Trump is elected, the inflation rate would definitely go higher. So to be honest, I think the U.S. public probably really cares about how much of a dozen of eggs in the supermarket. That's definitely what Trump said about Harris, that he's going to bring America to civil war <laughs> again. Maybe. The U.S. actually has come to the point that the social divide mm -hmm. has become so widened. As we know that U.S. debate has ended and we we're probably going to see the last debate before the election in November. And I believe many viewers have seen it through um, political shows and news about it. And today we want to talk about the U.S. election debate and the U.S. election from China's perspective and go in depth into the impact of the current American political uh, circumstances on the globe. And this is Space Bait. I'm Joe. And today I'm happy to invite Dr. Shen, Associate Professor from Central China University. Uh, so firstly, I want to talk about that. Uh, it has been a while since the presidential debate. I just want to ask for your brief um, views on these two candidates. Yes. Um, well, I would personally, I think Harris actually did a great job out of a lot of people's expectations. Mm -hmm. She was, you can see that she was very well prepared. Yeah. And I think during the debate, she just used her tactics very well um, and presented a very young and very sort of democratic elite um, figure well. I think uh, one of the tactics she used was that she used the endorsement very well. With every policy she puts out, she would say it was backed up by maybe Wharton School um, or backed up by the Nobel Laureate prize owner. So anyway, so she, she was very good at presenting her argument. However, at some point, she shows her nervousness, of course, because when she, she, she was vice president uh, of the United States, she didn't have this much of exposure to the public as much as... She used to be a DA. Yes, she's a prosecutor. But I think with this, this sort of amount of public ex exposure, of course, she's a lot more than um, other politicians. But if you compare with Donald Trump, yeah. um, I think she, she's not that expertise and comfortable with the, the exposure. So we move to the uh, Donald Trump part. Um, he, I think... He's a veteran who has been like several presidential debates, uh, whether it's in 16 against Hillary and now against Biden and then against Harris. So he's much more experienced. So how about your view on him? Yes, I think he's definitely a lot more experienced as a um, candidate for, yeah. for presidential election. Mm -hmm. um, he also, um, I think in this debate particularly, um, I think he was provoked actually by Harris. Yeah. So she knows how to provoke him. Let's move to the Donald Trump part. I think he is definitely still very good at using his mega <laughs> rhetorical. Uh, whenever he's attacked or whenever he felt a little bit disadvantaged, he'll put out his mega uh, rhetorical. And I think he plays out the nationalism very well as well. So you mentioned about the debate and what comes interesting to me that right after the debate, Trump posted on social media, says that uh, he declined the Harris uh, proposal for another debate. And it seems like uh, Fox, which is kind of leading right on the political spectrum, has said that uh, Harris uh, has performed well uh, in the presidential debate. I just wonder why Trump declined to have another debate uh, with Harris. Um, I think let's, um, let's talk about first why Harris would want to have a debate. For Harris and her team, they definitely believed that they make a comeback mm -hmm. compared with the previous one Biden had yeah. with <laughs> Donald Trump. Yeah. And of course, I think the reason why Trump doesn't have mm -hmm. another um, debate is that I think a lot of the, even the right-wing media, like mm -hmm. Fox News, mm -hmm. which is a very right-wing mm -hmm. uh, media of the United States, um, said that he didn't perform as well as mm -hmm. Harris. Mm -hmm. And also I think with the sort of um, the very specific part of voters that Trump wants to attract, um, TV debate may not be the best way. Mm -hmm. So he wins the constant pros, <laughs> probably chose not to have another debate. <laughs> so I think that's the reason why. Okay. So let's talk about the, uh, the coffee problem, which has been, always been the biggest or one of the major uh, problems, uh, whether it's in the U.S. or around the globe. Everybody, you know, as we know that the world economy is not going well right now. And uh, over the past few years, the inflation problem has already been a really major problem since the pandemic or between the pandemic. And in, I have data here in 21, it's 4.7 percent, 22 is 8 percent, and 23 is 4.1. It, it slows down a little bit, but it still has this high peak because we know that maybe 2% to 3% is kind of the ideal uh, spectrum for uh, inflation. So I just wonder what is status quo about the economic problems that in the United States and who is better to solve the inflation problem uh, in the US? If Donald Trump is elected, the inflation rate would definitely go higher. As he was elected eight years ago, he waged a uh, trade war and uh, imposed very high tax uh, on imported goods, not just to China, as well as to his allies. Yeah. <laughs> Whoever, whoever he thinks that the U.S. was in a disadvantaged position. If, they put, like if he puts 20% of the, the import tax on the goods, 
of course, the, the price in the, you know, the in the states market will go high. So inflation rate won't come. So the cost will actually go to the customer. Exactly, it will go to the especially the middle class people. Yeah. Yes, and supply chains. I think that's why Harris says uh, uh, emphasize a lot about the middle class trying to alleviate the burden uh, on middle class families, right? Exactly. I think if the the republic is is elected, the inflation rate uh, wouldn't be better than this stage. And also, I think there's another issue that we can't overlook the fact that whoever is elected, they have to have the control of the two houses. Uh -huh. So to be able to impose taxes or change the tax of the United States, you have to have the support from Senate mm -hmm. and the House of Representatives. So you need to have the whole Congress yeah. to, to be able to actually tackle the inflation rate. So I think that means bipartisanship, the consensus of the bipartisanship is very um, key to solve the inflation rate. And the third thing about the economy is that I wonder what exactly are the relationship between the U.S. and China. Okay, I think um, I'll put it in a very short way. I think in midterm, it depends on each country's um, own economy growth engine. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the U.S. and China's economy uh, depends on their own driving engine of its industries. Mm -hmm. So of course they are very intertwined yeah. um, in terms of trade, mm -hmm. but they are also very different countries with very different systems. Mm -hmm. And I think in the long run, the, the inflation rate of the U.S. wouldn't change much about China's economy at all which depreciated by approximately 4% against the dollar over the past year. Um, and of course, a weaker yuan makes China expo exports cheaper, but also increases the cost of importing raw materials and servicing foreign debt. And also on the supply chain side, um, US inflation has contributed to rising global com commodity prices. Um, but I think in the middle run, in the midterm, I think it depends on China and, economy, and the US economy's driving engine, their own industry growth. So in the long run, I think it wouldn't have that much effect on China at all. And according to my observation that the frequency of the word China that's been mentioned in this presidential debate has declined a lot compared to the last few debates, whether Trump versus Biden or Trump debates uh, eight years ago in 2016, that's China, China, China all the time, right? China, 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 China. So uh, based on my uh, impression that there are only like chips or tariffs, that's uh, certain topics related to China, but the frequency has kind of declined. So does that show that maybe the internal or domestic problems of US, like the economy, the immigrants, the uh, abuse of drugs uh, or gun violence has become the major contradictions that maybe has helped has made the um, U.S. ignore the problem of China, or should China be vigilant towards this kind of phenomenon? I think it's definitely a very good thing. That means the U.S. politician is, is paying attention to their own problems instead of um, blaming it on China. And I think the U.S. is prioritizing its own um, domestic issues, such as um, the, the, the gun violence mm -hmm. and economy inflation rates. Those are actually the issues that the U.S. has of its own, and it's not caused by any other country. And um, in terms of um, the foreign policy the U.S. has towards China, um, I think if the, the Democrats is elected, um, it definitely would put more effort into building their allies. Yeah. And of course, the, the Washington has already reached the consensus that China is a strategic competitor of the United States. Mm. It's not going to change. Mm. So, but at the moment, I think in the presidential election, you wouldn't have the, they wouldn't, they wouldn't put more energy into making that clear anymore. So to be honest, I think the U.S. public probably really cares about how much of a dozen of eggs in the supermarket, yeah. <laughs> rather than the U.S. would actually, you know, to yes. interfere with another country's yeah. um, business. Yeah. So um, also they would probably care if they will be able to carry abortion. So a lot of the media in the U.S. has say that the U.S. has come to the crossroad that determines maybe the future uh, of the United States. Uh, I just wonder that since Trump has appeared to the audience that they're unorthodox uh, candidates, and I just wonder whether the establishment will actually gain America back at this battlefield. Yes, and I think, of course, I think um, it is actually widely agreed by a lot of the U.S. Um, media elites that um, U.S. is at the most divided point of their history since the Civil War. Oh uh, yeah, that's exactly what Trump said about Harris that he's going to bring America to civil war <laughs> again. <maybe. laughs> but I think, with, especially with you can see the gun short that the, the Trump experienced, mm -hmm. it is actually quite a very um, dramatic and a very fierce um, outburst of the of the society. Mm -hmm. See something that said, take a look at what happened. Oh. <laughs> the the reason why is that I think um, the U.S. actually has come to the point that the social divide mm -hmm. has become so widened the conflict between the u.s society maybe comes out from the clash of the race and the class but i think now it becomes like the right wing and the left wing mm -hmm. 
the people who's pro um, abortion rights and the people who's against abortion rights, people who's pro illegal immigrants, people who who's against illegal rents, uh, immigrants. The society is very um, segmented at this point of the United States. So you mentioned about the the the, the rift that the society in the U.S. has been going on right now. So does that mean that the uh, U.S. society has been experiencing a kind of rift? And are they going into this kind of exhaustion? Yes, and I think it is definitely can be seen, especially if you look at the um, the abortion um, rights mm -hmm. debate. Now that there's no federal law um, to protect the rights of women to conduct abortion, the state has a right or, or, or the, the yeah or the definition of um, what is legal, what is illegal, mm -hmm. and that means for every state that the U.S. have, they will have a debate within the state, and all of the interest groups and all, um, the Republicans and the Democrats um, will put energies, mullings into... So, well, yeah. so as we know that there's an electoral vote mechanism in the uh, presidential debate or presidential election. Uh, so do you think that the abortion, the abortion issue will be a main factor that contribute to the results of the election? Yes, of course. I think you, if you look at the debate, mm -hmm. um, first of all, they, they talked about economy. Oh, yeah. The second issue that they brought up is abortion. Mm -hmm. so, and the, the third one is... Um, immigration. Immigration. Mm -hmm. So I think those those topics are always among the five most <laughs> yeah. concerned topics by the U.S. Um, public. But I think like back, back into Trump's administration that he overthrew the uh, Roe versus Wade, the abortion right, and to take take that from the women. And right now they're trying to debate it over uh, it again. But Trump said that he won't sign another uh, national bill to take away the rights, women's right to get an abortion. So I just find this a bit complicated. Like why? What are these both parties fighting for? Uh, over this, um, I think I think in the U.S. narrative, mm -hmm. one is called the, the the right of choice. Oh yeah. So the other one is right of the life. Oh. <laughs> so for the Republicans' narratives, they are protecting the lives of the babies, mm -hmm. even it before it's born. Mm -hmm. And for the Demo Democrats, they think they are protecting the women's rights mm -hmm. to whether they want to have so a. This seems to me that this will be a everlasting. Exactly, <laughs> and it, it has been in the U.S. history for a long time. But what happened is that I think it has become a very common sense um, in a lot of parts of the world that women has a right. To decide whether they want to have a baby. Mm -hmm. But the problem with the Trump's policy at one stage was that he took some of the rights away from women in some of the states, especially for the women who probably don't have a very high social economic status. It would be very hard for them. So as we know that the US has been caught like a melting pot for, for a long time over uh, the history. Uh, this country is basically consisted of uh, immigrants. And as we say that from 2008 when uh, Obama came to as uh, a President and Hillary becoming the female, the first female presidential candidate, and now Harris, a, a woman of color and of South Asian, taking to the poll as a presidential candidate. It seems like the gender or the racist uh, issues has been more and more popular in America in terms of getting the votes from the public. So I just wonder uh, how Dr. Shen view this kind of change and what does it mean to the U.S. politicians. I think in today's U.S. politics, um, despite the fact that a lot of the politicians don't want to brand themselves as identity politics, mm -hmm. but I think there's definitely a very strong part of identity yeah. um, politics inside. I think um, for the general public, voters are increasingly inclined to base their voting decisions um, on identity rather than on their you know, class mm -hmm. or their income. I think Trump represents um, some of the identity groups, for example, white male, mm -hmm. uh, white working class, mm -hmm. um, also nationalists, um, conservative Christians, and I think those are the identity tags that he has. Mm -hmm. Harris represents female um, black uh, communities and South Asian communities. And I think her vice president candidate, Tim Woods, mm -hmm. represents middle class white male. Um, I think the reason why Harris picked Tim Woods mm -hmm. is the sort of identity that Tim Woods has, mm -hmm. which would be very appealing to some of the voting base that Democrats is desperate to get. So what, what about Jenny Benz? Uh, I remember last time told, you told me that you were reading his book, The Hill, Hillbilly. Hillbilly, yes. Yeah. Um, I think that book is actually a, a, good, a good book to read and to understand the sort of <laughs> the, the life of the Rust Belt. They sort of felt very left out by the globalization and by the, um, by the politicians. So they are very angry, basically. The Rust Belt voters are very angry. So let's just talk about immigration. That, I think that Trump has repeatedly uh, stating one point it's, uh, about the immigration, whether it's in debates or in his um, public uh, presentations. He even mentioned about the rumors about the Haiti immigrants eating pets. Uh, that's why he was also mentioned during the presidential debates against Harris. They're eating the dogs, they're eating the cats. Eat the cat, eat, eat 
the cat. The they're cat. eating the dogs. They're eating the cats. As we know, USA is an immigrant country. Yeah. So since it was first um, established, it has immigrants all the time. So immigrants issue has always been been an issue in the governance of the United States government. But the reason why Republicans is very against illegal immigrants and the, the Democrats takes a, a more uh, we saw this maybe softer way to, to, to deal with uh, illegal immigrants is because, as you can see, Republicans um, control the states. A lot of them have a very high population in agriculture mm -hmm. and um, in working labor. Yeah. Whereas Democrats, the states that is controlled by Democrats, also are very uh, relatively higher educated mm -hmm. and have a higher socioeconomic status, such as California, mm -hmm. New York. Mm -hmm. um, but um, if you look at the Florida and all those um, concentrated states, they're all against illegal immigrants because their, their belief is that the illegal immigrants takes away their job. Mm. And also we know that the Democrats is of course more focused, has values on diversity and multiculturalism, yeah. whereas the Republican is more conservative. So of course those cultural values divides their attitude towards immigrants. And of course the war, you know, the, the, yeah. the China need to build the war yeah. in the, Chi uh, the, the, the US and uh, Mexico Trump border. Is building the war again, right? yeah, 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 he is, but it's not going to help. That's a very extreme way of tackling US illegal immigrants because mm. it's not going to help. You can't build actually a solid wall across the border mm. of thousands of thousands of kilometers. Yeah, but it's very costly. Yeah. Costly and it's not just, I, I think it's just not um, forcible it's, yeah. and it's not um, it's not working. Yeah, it's not yeah. going to work. But Trump has been using that tactic to attract those voters. No, oh, yeah. yeah, it's kind of a psychological. Exactly, kind of and um, and I think he's attracting those very radical ones. Yeah, those those people who has a very radical and a strong attitude towards yeah, them. Because it, it seems to me that uh, bringing the kind of idea is that uh, the reason that the American half civil war. Uh, back into eight is that the the use of economic tools has changed because uh, by that time the South part used slaves or yeah with slaves at their economic resources while the North side used industrial things to boost their economy so the different ways of applying to economic uh, progress has resulted in the final civil war because the unbalanced development and thus the differentiating of their idealism that caused to the civil war. I think that's maybe the same reason right now that it's because the middle side or the lower income side, their economic tools was taken away by some other countries like China or Mexico. But the California or New York, they have more high technology thing, economic tools to help them progress. I think you made a very good point, yes. actually. I think I just um, read that maybe in last week. <laughs> yeah. I think it's actually a very good point. I think the reason why um, for, for like for general public to, to have a very strong attitude towards the in illegal immigrants is probably because of the economy raiser, yes. the, the, you know, the fear of job loss, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, in terms of the violence and the, the, the violence, no, the crimes, is, yeah. I think yeah. maybe in some parts of the states, but not in all of the states. Mm -hmm. The United States has let the Middle East get totally out of control. Really bad things are happening, all easily within our power to stop. We have to fix our country. We have to bring peace. Our nation is in dire trouble. I will fix it. Since we mentioned about the region conflict, uh, uh, that I just want the first question I want to ask is about the Ukraine Russia conflict. Trump said that if he was reelected, he could end the uh, conflict in just 24 hours, and he uh, accused the Biden administration of doing nothing and let a war going on for another three years. So I just want to, uh, if Trump coming, can he really solve the conflict like, in 24 hours? Um, I don't think so. Think or can he solve it in a short time? Um, but I think no. With Trump's, I think what he's saying is that he wants to end the conflict mm -hmm. um, in a very as much as possible. Yeah. Um, whereas he uh, criticizes Biden is wedging a uh, World War III. Yeah. Um, so I think for the Trump, when we're talking about him, he just wanted to um, stop the aid, uh, not um, to the Ukraine. So I think if, if that, when Trump's in administration, he probably will, um, will end the, the, the conflict or will, will, or will deduct the sort of uh, um, aid that goes to Ukraine. It seems to me uh, the, the debate that, that Harry's or Biden administration have always focused on the alliance policies. Uh, she supported Israel, she supported NATO, she supported uh, Ukraine. But when it comes to Trump, Trump says, oh, okay, America first, I want to yeah, yeah, uh, cut all the aids if it's not in my interest. Uh, is that how it works? Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. The, the, actually, that's, that has been the tradition of the two parties for a very long time. So, so, um, so Democrats is more internationalism and they place a focus on their allies. But when Trump was in administration, he was drawn pretty much from all of those allies network. Yeah. So because he thinks those are all the burdens to the US. I think that that is more of um, Democrats is definitely more culturally or value based mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to a party. As you can see, the voting base is from um, different ethnic background. Mm -hmm. 
So, of course, I think when it comes to foreign policy, Democrats is more into the sort of allies. They believe that the allies would reinforce the U.S. hegemony for the Republicans, especially for the for Trump. Mm -hmm. He doesn't buy that at all. I think for Trump personally, he believes isolation. And I think he has that sort of mindset and everything can be exchanged. Mm -hmm. So friends and allies, he thinks a lot of things is negotiable. Mm -hmm. uh, the second, the, the second uh, regional conflict there is a Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict. And Trump also said uh, in the debate that if he was a president, the uh, conflict won't happen. But uh, uh, he tried to depict Harris as a person who hated Israel and Arab. And, he also said that if Harris was elected, that Israel won't be existed in two years. Uh, but, but we also know the fact that in 2017, that uh, Trump actually acknowledged uh, the Jerusalem as a, a capital of uh, Israel and moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to uh, Jerusalem. Last month, I also took an action endorsed unanimously by the U.S. Senate. I recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And that's also inside the Hamas. So, so uh, in terms of the uh, political interest, I just want to know how, uh, what kind of political interest that the, do both parties stand down uh, on Palestinian-Israel issues? Um, I think, w first of all, I would like to make a very clear point is that U.S. bipartisan support for the Israel. Mm -hmm. So there's a bipartisan support of Israel. It's consensus. Yeah, it's yeah. consensus. Mm -hmm. The only difference between the, 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 the Democrats and the Republicans is that I think especially with the uh, um, with the Palestinian issue is that Democrats, uh, of course, supports the Israel to, to take out the Hamas. But at the same time, they wanted some humanitarian support for the Palestinian people, whereas Republicans take a more strong stance. So I think that's the difference between the two parties. But in essence, they're the same. So my last question is, will Dr. Shen give us the prediction? Because we know that the poll before the ABC debate, the actual approval ratings is kind of neck to neck. Um, uh, so uh, maybe this is the last presidential debate before November's election. So can you give us a maybe small prediction <laughs> of who's going to win? Well, first of all, I think it's a very dangerous thing to do any predictions <laughs> for any uh, international yeah. relations yeah. Um, uh, researcher. But I would like to say that I think um, the U.S. is at a crossroads, um, crossroads point. And I think also it is, it's, a, it's probably a turning point for the world as well. We probably will, would say that um, the anti-globalization mm -hmm. um, and the, the sort of trade war mm -hmm. that we saw before would come back. Mm -hmm. And also I think the social divide will also become um, increasingly white in the States. So that would be the end of our show today. And we're looking forward to have more topics with Dr. Shen next time. Thank you again for coming to our show. Thank you.